just how silent films are remembered. Physical gags, always good for a laugh. Over in a second. But behind the comedy lay a world of painstaking planning, immense courage, and physical skill. The world of the stuntman. Talking pictures had the benefit of back projection. Actors could ride wild horses in total safety. silent days, back projection had yet to be invented. Whatever stunt you saw on the screen had actually been achieved, either by the actor himself or by a stuntman doubling for him. Actor, Monty Banks. Stuntman, Harvey Parry. Monty Banks, Harvey Parry. A good stuntman, his mind has to be at least 14 feet ahead of his body. That's the way he can stay alive, you know. Harvey Parry came into pictures before the word stuntman was coined. In the days, years ago, they would go out in the street like an old Paramount studio, not Paramount, it was called Brunton Studio. And they had the pepper tree out there with a great big uh, bench that surrounded the tree. And the extras sit out there and they'd shoot crap and play cards. <clears throat> the casting director or somebody come out and say, anybody want to make $10? They never said, what have we got to do? They said, yeah, I will. All right, so they, the guy go up there and they maybe have jump off this building. So he'd jump, you know? If he made it fine, if he didn't, he got free room and board in the hospital for a while. With so many people struggling for so few jobs, volunteers for danger were plentiful. On a vast pyramid built against a hill in Santa Monica, Cecil B. DeMille staged this 1917 battle scene. He encouraged the extras to fight and not to worry about getting hurt. And Cecil said to one man, I will give five dollars i believe it was that was a bounty in those days to anyone who will roll down the flat side not on the stairs but the flat side of the pyramid and down slid and rolled the man and of course he would roar when he got to the bottom and i remember his being taken aside and painted with iodine well he didn't yell and scream but i don't know why he didn't it was one of the horrible things i saw <laughs> Hunting in the silent days was a job with few veterans. 
But as the industry grew, it became more organized. High dives up to 60 feet were paid at a dollar a foot. Upsetting a wagon, $30. Being dragged through the sagebrush, $20 extra. Motorcycle to plane transfer, $100. But often, stuntmen were on a weekly salary, $150 to do everything. Audiences were hard to satisfy. Each week on the news weeklies, they could see real crashes like these. They would not accept fake crashes in the weekly serial. Harvey Parry specialized in car wrecks. That was uncalled for. I couldn't help it. The car just got away from me. I was going, maybe I was going too fast. And it was an old, uh, I think it was an old Winton or something like that, an old car, open car. And I got it broadside and I went, it went over. Instead of going over, boom, and coming back on its wheels, it went over a couple of times and bounced right across the camera. Cameramen had a keen appreciation of the stuntman's skill. Harvey was the, uh, uh, the greatest guy behind the wheel of a car that I have ever seen. He would go through windows, over cliffs, in a car that defied your intelligence to figure out what he was thinking of, how he was going to survive these damn things. Uh, Harvey would take the lead, and he would come out of a cloud of smoke into something he'd never seen before and figure it out in midair. <laughs> he had the guts of a wildcat. In the old days, when they used the Model T Fords, the brakes weren't worth a hoot, you know. And they used to poop out and do it and chase it after two or three little attempts. They used reverse sometimes. We had three pedals. You put your foot in reverse, and sometimes that'd break it, and sometimes it'd louse the car up. So to get the skids and spins and whatever you had out of it, like we'd come down hills, and down at the bottom of the hill, they would get grease, soap and water on the street, you know, wet it down, and you'd come down and turn the wheel and do this, you know. You didn't know what the hell was gonna happen. The big stars seldom took big risks, but lesser-known actors, particularly in westerns, were expected to do at least some of their own stunts. Fred Thompson was an Olympic athlete who had become a cowboy star. In this western, his director, Al Rogel, set up a chase sequence down the steep gradient of the Hollywood Hills. We were using the stagecoach, which had run away, and Fred was to pick up the team. In order to get Fred and the horses and the depth, the scene and the ravine and whatnot, we had these two cameras set on the back of the stagecoach, and to keep the stagecoach from wobbling too much, we'd had, I don't know how many sacks of sand that we put down in the boot and in the coach. So it was extremely heavy, and I was up there watching it, and gave the signal, and the horses started out, and Fred made his transfer right on a turn, and the horse went down, the wheel ho horse went down, and Fred went down with him, and the coach with four men and all his sand went over both of his legs. And he went to the hospital and was there for, we didn't know how long, but the picture was finished. I let that go to the last scene in the picture. And that's where Yakima Canut got his great idea, which he has done a thousand times since. I picked up Yakima Canut under the wheels of the stagecoach, hanging on to the rear end and working on his stomach up under the coach and onto the tongue and working his way on up to the leaders 
and pulling them up at the edge of the cliff. Now that becomes a famous stunt, and it was all done by accident. Raised on a ranch, Yakima Kanat won so many rodeo trophies that he was signed for pictures as a cowboy star himself. But what fascinated Kanat were the mechanics of stunt work. When I first went into pictures, they was falling off a horse, uh, upsetting wagons, rigs, uh, what they called a bulldogging, where you'd ride up alongside of a man, grab him, pull him off the horse, go down between the horses. Half the time, horses would step on you and skin you all up. So I started taking these gags and building them up, making them a little different. The bulldogging, I pull my stirrups up shorter, ride up, I'd make a jump and light on behind the fella and grab him and turn a flip off the horse backwards with him. I tried to keep one notch ahead of the rest of the sun man, which there wasn't too many of them in those days anyway. In 1926, Connett starred with a horse called Rex. Rex had already killed a man in Colorado. This was a horse that you had to keep your eye on at all times, even though I rode him in the scenes and worked with him a lot. You never could tell when he was going to turn and uh, attack you. Rex was more dangerous than Kanat expected. He gave the director, Fred Jackman, an ultimatum. I'm going to uh, do the scene under one condition. He'd let me take the horse and take him into the training stable, take him into the arena and work him for uh, one hour. And uh, I said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm going to take a billiard cue and a whip. I hope I don't have to use the billiard cue, but uh, when I come out of there, he'll have a little respect for me. And so the director said, well, okay, he owned half interest in the horse. He said, okay, go ahead. So I took him, and this horse, I put him through his work fast. I could make him make work faster and faster till he got him angry. And then he turned and charged me, and when he did, I just backed up, sliced him across the nose of this buggy whip, backing up to get my billiard cue. <laughs> And we'd come back and we did the scene, he charged in, and every time I'd holler at him, he'd stop. We got some good scenes of him, but he was a, he was a kind of an outlaw horse at heart. But he was a, had a kind of a personality, too. But you see, you had a different breed of cat then than you have now. Uh, the stuntman of years ago, come out of left field, most of them. The ones that progressed and made good later on and made the business what it is today, most of them came out of circuses, carnivals. They had a vaudeville. They had a background. Richard Talmadge was a vaudeville acrobat who worked later with Douglas Fairbanks. Joe Bonomo, a circus strongman and a professional wrestler. Paul Malvin came from a family of acrobats. As a child, he'd worked on the stage with Chaplin. It was the skill he learned as an acrobat that would save his life when he worked on the 1927 historical picture, Beloved Rogue. I was hired to double Barrymore throughout the whole picture. And um, we come to the situation in the picture where the three beloved rogues who was Max Wayne, Slim Somerville and John Barrymore at that particular time in France. They were Robin Hoods. They were trying to feed the people of Paris. 
So up on the tops of the walls of Paris, they had a great big catapult built, which was about 30 feet long, and the vagabonds were up there filling this thing with cabbages and carrots and turnips and so and whatnot, food enough to throw it into the city of, of Paris for the poor people. all through the picture and they flounder around. Barrymore was up in the basket loading its stuff and Max Wayne was handing it to Slim Somerville to put the hand up to him but Slim Somerville goes by and trips the trip throws it and throws Barrymore over the city of Paris. He goes through the Bastille windows and lands on a bed and rolls off in front of Marceline Day who was the leading lady and that was the sequence of the picture. In the script, it didn't say how they were going to do it or anything. So I go over there, and here's this great, huge catapult thing bent quarter down, pulled down, and I thought, oh my gosh. And out there, about 50, 75 feet, they got a net, a 50 foot square net. And they said, all right, Paul, get in here. Alan Crosland was directing the picture. He says, all right, Paul, we're ready for this. And he said, get in. He said, we'll shoot you. We, we'll do the shot now. And I said, wait a minute, Alan. I said, uh, you, uh, you intend to put me in this thing and shoot me into that net out there? He said, yes. He said, that's, what it's, uh, that's the first shot of the sequence of going over the city of Paris. And um, I said, well, just a minute now. Uh, uh, you're playing with my life. How do you know I'm going to land in that net? And they said, well, just a minute. So they call in the engineers, technicians, and so forth. And they said, oh, hell, Paul, it's all figured out mathematically. And I said, well, uh, it might be mathematically to you. I said, but uh, I'd like to see something done. He said, oh, you're just wasting time. We've got this figured out on, on, on the blueprints and papers. I said, well, look, this is my life now. Let, let's put a sack of sand in. I weigh 165 pounds. Put a sack of sand in there, and let's see what happens. Oh, uh, well, all right. Cross and said, okay, Paul, put it, let's put it in for Paul. They put a sack of sand in there and they tripped it. It went a block and a half through the top of the stage. That sack of sand, I said, there goes your mathematics. All to hell, boys. <laughs> Malvern made them test the stunt repeatedly with sacks of sand until they'd got the range right. Then he did it. But another angle and a further stunt were required. Now that was a quite a deal. I had to do a, um, a, an 80-foot net dive, and it was off the top of a stage, and all the way down the top of the stage, they'd have peaks in the tops of buildings built on a side angle. The camera then would was placed on a side angle over on the side. So consequently, when I dove off into the net, and they shot it from the angle that they would straighten it out, I was going over the tops of the buildings and the points and everything else. I did that in two different deals so that we had showing me progress across the city of Paris. And I got up 15 feet and dove through that. Of course, I had plenty of mattresses on the other side and dived through the candy window. Now that was the progression of the first catapult over the city in two shots through the outside window. Then they come on the inside and rebuild the candy window, new candy window, and the bed is there. And now I can stand right outside of the window and dive right straight through down onto the bed. And of course, they'd cut and Barrymore would come in right after that. The public had to believe that the stars did their own stunts. With a star like Douglas Fairbanks, they wanted to believe it. The big stars did not do their own stunts. The studios stopped them from doing them because if a star got hurt, it stands to reason everybody was laid off. The show couldn't go on. So it's much easier if they hurt a stuntman than it is to hurt the star. But a lot of them take credit for doing their own stunts, but they absolutely do not do them. Douglas Fairbanks was a special case. The most famous athlete in pictures, he was renowned for doing all his own stunts. Yet as these outtakes from the gaucho demonstrate, even he employed stuntmen. The stuntman did the stunt, Douglas Fairbanks refined it. But some stunts were filmed in such long shot that it was pointless for Fairbanks to do them. Pointless and risky.
Fairbanks always gave his audiences outstanding value. He combined an enthusiasm for history with a bravura sense of filmmaking. Much of Fairbanks' magic sprang from his sense of self-parody. He relished the chance to introduce in each new picture more and more ingenious tricks and stunts. When Doug did any of these stunts, he was essentially graceful. That's the one thing we struggled for and I insisted on. It was never to be evident, any evidence of, of an effort on his part. Now, when I did them for him, to show him what was expected, I was necessarily awkward. I weighed maybe 40 pounds more than he did, although I was his height. But uh, I did it by sheer muscular push, while he did, did it uh, gracefully. If I struggled through the air, he floated through the air. And everything we did was based on measurement of his reach. Never did he reach with a great effort. It was a hand all was ready, it was there to pull him. And so when he did these things, it was artistic and based on the fact it was measured. We had stairs specially built so that he would gracefully go up and down them. If I make the point, that's what we were after in all the stunts that he did, was grace and agility, like a ballet dancer. Pirate, directed by Al Parker, and Fairbanks captured a Spanish galleon single-handed in the new process of Technicolor. The famous one of sliding down the sails very, very spectacular, was not as difficult to do as it appeared because um, if you actually did try to do it, it'd be literally impossible. You cannot stick a knife in a canvas sail and slide down in one hand. I mean, the, A, the sail would be too tough, and the knife wouldn't cut it, and no one, even the strongest man in the world, couldn't hold on to his own weight and push through the sail. So, in actual fact, my Uncle Robert, who was an engineer, he devised a means of putting the sail on a kind of angle so it wasn't straight up and down. The camera also on an angle so that on the screen it would be looking like that. Um, the, the sail had been pre-sliced and then stitched up invisibly. So it was just minor stitching so it would split anyway. And so in one scene the knife would go in, be a quick cut away, and the next time actually there was a fixed 
knife was already there with a counterweight back of the sail that you didn't see that you just hold on to like a like a lift something with a counterweight and wires that would just haul him down through this pre-slip sail stunned crazy America of the 20s, these men and women are risking their lives for money, for thrills, for the newsreels, to publicize a building, to open a store. When comedian Harold Lloyd saw a human fly climb the Brockman building in downtown Los Angeles, he was horrified, hid his eyes, and had the idea for his most famous comedy, Safety Last. Lloyd played a department store employee facing dismissal who dreams up an idea to save his job and publicize the store. He thinks he's found a professional human fly, but he has to climb the building himself. The film was alarmingly realistic, and many in the audience hid their eyes. In other words, they're up just as high as you see them. People are underneath us. It's time we photograph them. But I remember C.B. DeMille, I think you, a great producer, he saw a picture we did called Safety Last, and he came out and he says, you know, Harold, if I hadn't have known that you were just a few feet off the ground he said you'd have had me really scared and i said well cb i said i got news for you we were up there and i started telling him how we did it and finally he says look at the palms of my hand he says they're all damp <laughs> The idea that Harold Lloyd climbed the building entirely alone has long been accepted, but he didn't. I doubled Harold, and every precaution that I wanted in climbing the buildings and so forth, anything protection I wanted, I could have. The only one thing I couldn't have is publicity, which was all right with me. I didn't care. What, was it, what did it mean to me? Nothing. I never mentioned that I doubled Harold Lloyd until Harold passed on. The human fly in this shot is Harvey Perry. This is Harold Lloyd. Lloyd was a capable athlete who achieved a great deal of the climb himself, but he could hardly be exposed to a hundred foot drop. So how was the rest of the climb achieved? Remember, there was no back projection. Lloyd had to be as high above the ground as he appeared to be. The answer was as simple as it was ingenious. We built, built a set on top of the 14-story building that would be maybe two and a half stories in height. Right on the edge, facing in toward the, the roof of the building. Now, when they photographed it, they photographed it in such an angle that it looked like it was on the opposite side of the street. And you could see all that traffic underneath you. Where if Harold did fall, or I did fall, doing some things that were a little more dangerous that you wouldn't want to do up at 14 stories, uh, we'd only fall maybe 15, 16 feet. And we'd have pads down there in case he did fall. 
paraloid only, a lot of people didn't know it, only had part of a hand. On his right hand, it was blown off by a firecracker in a still picture one time. If you ever notice, he'd hang mostly with his, his left hand because he couldn't hang with the right. Lloyd wore a special glove to conceal his missing fingers, so his disability was never apparent. Harold couldn't stand height, although he did safety last and feet first in those things. By the mid-1920s, audiences were blasé about stunt work. They imagined it was all perfectly safe. They expected stunts which patently could not be faked, in particular violent air crashes. The man most in demand for this kind of work was Dick Grace who kept this unique roll of film showing the best of his stunts and those which didn't quite come off. The aviation epic, Wings, involved the best flyers the Air Corps could produce, yet the stunt work was still entrusted to Dick Grace. It nearly ended his career. Dick could do anything in a flying thing. And in wings, I'll never forget, he did this tremendous spin into the ground and hit bum on his nose and the plane turned over just about like that. It didn't go all the way over. And we all ran over because we figured he may have got hurt, you know. Billy Wellman was there and Bill says, you all right, Dick? Dick says, I'm okay. He said, well, come on out. So Dick undid his belt, not figuring he would hang it upside down, and run on top of his head and broke his neck. Despite his injury, Grace managed to return to stunt flying for the 1928 war film Lilac Time. He was crazy. <laughs> he was a marvelous stunt flyer. He and there were a group of them who did the stunts on lilac time and uh, in the planes, cracking them up. Colleen Moore played an inquisitive French girl on a farm used as an airfield in World War I. I'll never forget, uh, uh, Dick uh, uh, came to the director and he, he had a stick and he, they walked out and he said, no, and he drew a cross in the dirt. He said, is this where you want me to crack up? And the cameraman and the director said, yes. Now he said, do you want me with the wings toward you or do you want exactly how the crack up was? And they told him and he took a little saw and he began sawing this plane apart. And then he went up and came down and cracked exactly as he said. Stunt flyers were known as barnstormers. The newsreels, always looking for action, were ideal screen tests for the most daring pilots and wing walkers. The 
The most charismatic of the Schilflers was Oma Locklear. He won his reputation in the Air Corps, climbing out repeatedly onto the wings and even the axles of aircraft in mid-flight. He found such danger exhilarating. In 1919, for the newsreel cameras, he performed a plane-to-plane -plane transfer without a parachute. Locklear was hired for pictures. These, they, these, uh, this Omar Locklear was a very popular man, very interesting man, very daring young man, and he took all the stars up, and every time he came to the studio, I succeeded very tactfully in avoiding him, you see, because I was scared to death of the eye. I wasn't scared, but I wasn't particularly interested. I was having too much fun on earth. So, um, he, uh, he said, he, he, he uh, stopped me in the hallway and he said, I know, you're Leatrice Joy. And I, and I knew who he was, you know, and I made like I was very weak and about to die, you see, so he wouldn't think I was too robust to take up there. But anyway, he said, you know, you're the only star, now come on now, let's make a day of it. So I said, all right. So he said, right now. So I said, all right. So we went out, and this plane, of course, when you see the ones of today, if you can catapult yourself back to a little cracker box, so help me heaven, with two single seats, one in the front and one in the rear, you see. And uh, I got in this thing, and we start zooming up like that, you know. And, and I, as I said, I always controlled myself in a moment like that, and I said, now you're in it, now enjoy it, you know, and just just be your age, you know. And I, I he made an element curve, one of those things like that, you see, and then the reverse of it, and all those kind of things. And I thought I had had enough, you see, so I uh, made some kind of gesture to him, and I did this, meaning take me down, you know. I was I was thrown in the sponge and giving up completely because I'd had enough of it. And he, he did this to me, you know. I and what's he so happy about taking me down? And all of a sudden, he zoomed up, and he went into the most daring of any of those stunts, the falling leaf. You go down and down and down till you practically pick buttercups, you see, and then he stops. And uh, he, he ran to the back of it, and he picked me up, and he said, Congratulations, you're the only star with guts, Miss Joy. You're the only one who asked for the falling leaf. Yum, 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 yum. And I didn't have the courage enough to say, That was my sponge I was throwing out, you know. Locklear was particularly interested in an actress called Viola Dana. I looked at this great big handsome man, and he looked at me, and... He said, would you like to go up with me? I said, yeah, yes, I would. I'd love it. And he had green eyes, too. And I want to tell you, those. we looked at each other, and up I went with him in one of those old Jennies. I afterwards found out, well, that was it. We, I guess we fell in love immediately. <laughs> everything in a plane that's to be done. Loops, I've been done one day, we did something like 25 consecutive loops and spins and barrel rolls and we'd go under telegraph, uh, under, between telegraph poles under the wires and chase our friends down Hollywood Boulevard if we saw them, I'd carry a bunch of old lipsticks and we'd throw, we'd, that's how low we'd fly, we'd throw them down and then you could see them look up and say, <laughs> of course, they, uh, I think they got after him, too. He, he left, had to leave town. He hid out for about a week. Locklear continued to appear at shows around the country, keeping in touch with an anxious Viola Dana by telephone and telegram. There's nothing dangerous in the work, he insisted. I do absolutely nothing that could be called a risk of life. Everything I do is planned methodically and is absolutely safe. Fox brought him back to Hollywood to star in The Skywayman in 1920. Aerial scenes were photographed at the DeMille Airfield, next to the oil fields. He was making a picture for Fox. They were starring a minute, and um, he was uh, doing some night flying, tailspin. And he said to the director, he said, now, when... I get down to the level of the oil wells, take the lights off me, the sunlight arcs, take those lights off me and I'll know where I am, I can come out of it. And he went into the tailspin and they never took the lights off him. And of course he, into a, an oil sump. 
<clears throat> I guess there was practically nothing left of him because the, those Jennies, you know, they were very fragile. I, they, somebody picked me up, but the, I started to run for the plane and somebody said, grab her, grab her and take her home. And uh, I guess I was kind of, I was just kind of crazy. I couldn't believe what had happened. Those, and, and when you're young, those things are very shocking. I don't even like to talk about it. Fox rushed the Skywaymen into release and announced that a share of the profits would be given to the families of Locklear and his co-pilots. Ten percent. Two years later, Universal made a serial called Around the World in 18 Days. Aerial stunts were increasingly popular with audiences and increasingly hazardous for the men who tried them, like Gene Perkins. And I was at Universal working with Perkins, and they had an episode in which, uh, at Marsh Field, they wanted the uh, Perkins to, to come across in an aeroplane and drop down and give the the girl who was on the top of the train, some documentary papers and so forth. So they had hired some fellow with an old Jenny plane to, with a rope ladder on it to go out and come around, and I was the, doubling the girl on top of the train. There was a young pilot uh, at this, carrying passengers at the field, and Leo Nomus was flying for me to do the change, and if you do it right, it's, it looks simple because he'd come up behind the train and uh, he set the man right down on it. But uh, the pilot has to watch because there's an air turbulence and it'll make the plane, you know, if you over-control, it'll wipe back and forth. So this kid didn't know it. He went to Universal and told, and all the studios, and told him that he was a stunt pilot, that he had flown the plane change for me, and so naturally they accepted that. And uh, so they hired him. Well, of course, the fellow went around, circled around the train. The train was doing about, I guess, 45, 50 miles an hour up there by Marshfield. And instead of going behind the train and coming up the back end of the train, he came straight across the side. Now, Perkins, instead of standing in the bottom rung of the rope ladder, he hung. Of course, Gene hadn't been a regular plane changer. He didn't know these things. So when they went to do it, he climbed down on the end of the ladder and when you do that, you don't hang at the bottom along because if you met, if they don't get, you have to pull back up again. So uh, what I would do is take two holds, you know, and foot, and I'd I'd come down, and if he didn't get close enough, I'd come back up, and and rest my arms. Well, he went down so low that he hit the windows of the train, and they dragged him across the top of the train. And when the plane got over on the other side, in a bank, to try to get up, his ribs were broken, and he couldn't climb back. And Gene uh, shook his head, he couldn't hang on, and he turned loose and fell in a plowed field. And his legs, uh, bones went through his shoes into the ground, and it looked like he was standing uh, knee-deep in, in a hole. Then they wanted, later on, in that particular serial, for me to go out here to a semaphore on the uh, railroad tracks and match up the fall. And I said, I don't remember reading anything about this in here. And he said, no, but they said, where, well, we want to pick it up where Perkins fell and, and uh, went down. I said, you know, he got killed in that. And they said, yes, you know, well, we, we just go ahead and pick it up right there. I said, you don't pick it up with me because I'm not going to jump off of there and, double it and do it for you. And which I didn't do because I didn't think it was cricket, so to speak. MGM's epic, The Trail of 98, was a story of the Klondike Gold Rush. Shot on location, no expense spared. The Trail of 98, made by MGM, was probably one of the most disastrous pictures of that era, because we lost four men in one scene, in which we only recovered two of the bodies. Stunts were usually planned inch by inch, but natural hazards, such as dangerous rapids, had to be left mainly to chance. They were far beyond the calculated risk. There was eight stunt men that went up. 
the eight of us in two boats. And we were to go in the center of the river, and there was more water pouring through that gorge than pours through the Mississippi River at the highest tide. So up we go. The cameras are all about seven cameras stretched out down along the river, one on the, two of them on the tracks following down in, in uh, those uh, little Ford cars. And uh, so the rocket went up, and all these boats shoved off. Well, I want to tell you, my boat, when I looked out there and I came down that first thing and went down into that first well, there was a wall of water in front of me that was breaking back this way, higher than this room, which is a good eight, nine feet higher, or maybe 10 feet falling back. Well, of course, I shipped water immediately. We were in the center of the stream, and the, the waves were like breakers in the surf. And we were going 35 mile an hour because the camera was on a, a Ford car with flange wheels, and they ran down a railroad track right down the gorge. And they had to go 35 mile an hour to keep even with us. And I had oak sweep oars in there. I had three or four of them in there. I was on the sweep oar in the back. And to try to hold that boat straight, it, it got about a foot and a half, two a foot of water in it. And I lost control, and those sweep oars would just break. I was just bending them, trying to keep that thing straight. Well, of course, all boats were going over, and men was going out down and everything. It was just a catastrophe. Safety ropes had been run across the river, fitted with loops. The second unit director was supposed to arrange for the loops to be reinforced with wire, which would hold them open. But he didn't. There was no loop in the end. When it done, it just wound up, and it's like a hard twist rope with frozen stick. So the two men that grabbed the rope, when they slid uh, on the rope, they slid down to, to the end of the rope, to get the loop because their hands are cold and they come down and there's nothing but a frozen twisted rope and they couldn't hold on from the ice water on their hands and they had to turn loose so they tried to start swimming to shore and one man he made it but uh, he, he made it part way and the other man uh, we saw him going right on down the stream and there's a big boulder size of a small bungalow that the water would hit and spew up over and he went into that and it hit and knocked him and we knew he was dead and he went on down into the glacier lake now, i finally got the boat landed ashore not landed but got out of it and let it go then we started searching for help, help anybody was stuck. And we found men here and found men there. Well, we searched for 10 days. We finally found two of the bodies. What we never did find Red Thompson's body because uh, what happens in that ice water, when the uh, body sinks, the, the gas doesn't form and they never rise. So we never did find Red's body. So that, that was the, the heartbreaking part of it because I had gotten him the job. I had re recommended him because uh, he was a good type for a certain man. And I thought, well, now, if I hadn't gotten him in the job, he'd have still been here. But that's part of the hazard of the game. Yes, dear, you know, we well, just a different day. Just a different day. I wish I could, I wish I could really explain. I wish I could really give what's in here out to you there. Of the, 
the greatness of the old days. They made good pictures, too. Pretty good pictures. And with a box lunch and a $2 bill and a roll of film, that's what it was. But it was great.